settle down. Uh, we have a token of appreciation for Dr. Manoj. Uh, this is a small box for him. So, kind of. Thank you so much. And a few books and things like uh, other things that we'll give it to you later. But thanks a lot sir, for coming. Uh, our next subject is vitamin D and calcium. Uh, we'll begin with uh, calcium and then go to vitamin D. And I am sure that there are quite a few questions, an interesting area, day-to-day -day area. Uh, but hold the questions till we finish. Uh, the first question to sir is, uh, what are the daily calcium requirements of, uh, I, at, at what age? So, <coughs> let's talk of the regular calcium requirement. It's about 1000 milligrams a day. Pregnancy, lactation, 1200, 1400 mg. Growing children, 600, 800 milligrams. But we can stick with the average of 1000 milligrams per day. What should you eat to be able to get 1000 milligrams? So, you know, <coughs> uh, a couple of years ago, the IOF, International Osteoporosis Foundation, and then we had some studies in Delhi. Uh, we found that the average Indian is getting about 350 milligrams of calcium per day. So the first advice always is get, try to get enough calcium from your diet. And then from past experience, we know that Indians don't take enough calcium. So you need to take calcium supplements. Uh, talking about diet, again, there are two schools. One is for milk and the other is anti-milk. The anti-milk are welcome to their opinion. Those who are for milk, if they can get their patient to take the equivalent of one liter of milk. So, one ml of milk gives you one milligram of elemental calcium. And please don't equate with this your calcium tablet. Huh? That I'll tell you later on what it means. So one ml of milk gives you one mg of elemental calcium. So one liter of milk can equivalent. Like milk, curd, paneer, cheese. So that's the possibly the easiest way of taking calcium in your diet. The other thing is <coughs> green leafy vegetables, some fruits. I think the best fruit that I tell my patients is chiku. Which part of the chiku? Skin. No. <laughs> Skin to firbi, most of us eat it, wash it and eat. Ah, jo, jo part wo, jo safed <laughs> rehte na, around the seed which we just throw it out. That is full of calcium. Non-vegetarians can get calcium from their meat and those who have fish and especially the fish with the yeah, small bones you can get calcium from that. But the leafy vegetables, now one controversy that comes out is wheat has a lot of calcium, but it also has a lot of phytate. So that calcium is not available for absorption. But ragi is a good source of calcium. We are talking about fruit, so custard apple is a good source. Dry fruit is a good source, uh, especially those who can afford it, then almonds, Anjir, uh, dates, they can all give you a reasonable amount of calcium. But all said and done, sub karke we, <coughs> most of us need calcium supplements. One source which I cannot recommend, but if you are already having pan, so uh, when I, it, it is not recommended to start after Dr. Chadda's lecture. <laughs> but if someone is used to having pan with a little chuna, that gives you a good amount of calcium. Okay, uh, so if you say that after doing everything, uh, maybe we don't get enough calcium. So at what age should we start calcium supplements? So actually there is no age. If you are not getting enough calcium that is recommended for you at whatever age, you need to take calcium supplements. I mean, again I repeat, try to get it from the diet only. But suppose somebody has milk allergy, for yes, example, take it. Then, then they can take. 
uh, whatever supplements, I mean, whatever dietary other sources are there, otherwise then you need to take supplements. And you were saying the milligrams of milk are different from milligrams of tablets? Is it? Okay, so, yeah, what I said was 1 ml gives you 1 mg, but when you see the tablet content, it is much higher. Because tablets have a bioavailability, I mean, everything doesn't get absorbed. So when you see a tablet which says 500 milligrams, it will have much more of the salt. So what calcium carbonate 40 percent gets absorbed. Calcium citrate, calcium citrate malate is about 33 percent. What we used to get at KEM hospital of calcium lactate, which is about 12 percent. So then you ended up giving 8 to 12 tablets of calcium lactate. But uh, the newer ones, carbonate, citrate malate, maybe between one and two tablets will give you 500 milligrams, not 1,000, 500 milligrams. You have got fancy, <coughs> expensive calciums also in the market, uh, which are stomach friendly. So if you take a large amount of calcium together, you get dyspepsia, constipation, acidity, gas, and all that. So if it's a large dose of calcium, then you need to split it up into two or three doses. Calcium and iron are not to be given together. Generally, there are some preparations you can give, but as a rule, keep calcium at night and iron in the afternoon. The two commonest salts that we use are calcium carbonate, which are you know, brands like Shellcal, Teo, etc., and calcium citrate malate, the brand like CCM, etc. Uh, what is the difference between carbonate and uh, citrate? So, you understand, <coughs> we generally give them after meals because you need some amount of acidity for the carbonate to break down. The citrate is less absorbed than carbonate. I said carbonate, it's about 40 percent absorption. But the citrate is supposed to be more stomach friendly and more kidney friendly. Because when the citrate is there in the tubular fluid, it prevents calcium from getting precipitated. So, Probably if there is a family history or you are worried about renal stones, then go for citrate malate. If there is no family history and patient, because again that is a little more expensive than carbonate. But I, I would start with carbonate and then go on to the next choice. So uh, as we know, many calcium tablets which are carbonate contain 500 milligram elemental calcium. And the citrate malate, citrates usually contain 250 milligram elemental calcium. And therefore, and uh, he is also saying that citrate is absorbed less than carbonate. So effectively, the milligrams of uh, available calcium in a tablet of CCM becomes much lesser than in a tablet of shell cal. Is that right? And how do we therefore yeah. calculate? No, no. So what you are written on that bottle, mm -hmm. 500 and 250 is what actually reaches inside. Okay. So that you can, I mean, don't break your head on it. it they have done it for you already. Achha, they have done it for, okay. So when you say absorption is 40% so you say is already... So you the 500 bottle mm. or the uh, strip, if you look at it, the salt is 1,250 milligrams. Correct. So they have done the calculation for you and given you... Elemental calcium yes. is this much. Okay. Correct. So uh, what calcium preparation would you suggest to them? as a standard carbonate no no so yeah that's what carbonate. carbonate and then if the patient is not tolerating or if there is some family history or you are worried about renal stones citrate so so the acid yeah so ppi you gonna as i said you need acidity you need acid for absorption of the cell so as i uh, will not interrupt so calcium citrate three situations he is delineated to give calcium citrate one carbonate causes gi side effects then citrate can be tried. One patient has history of renal stones or family history of renal stones, calcium stones that is, then citrate can be tried. And if the patient wants to take it irrespective of meals, then citrate can be tried. And as she said, PPIs, patients on PPIs, you should probably give citrates for better absorption. So you can choose between these two. Uh, what are the commonest reasons why you have to stop calcium after giving it. I think uh, if the patient cannot tolerate the calcium that you have given, that would be the 
communist reason to stop there are so there is a you know fear about uh, calcium and stones please understand that a large majority of renal stones we don't know why they occur and when we don't know something then we start instead of prescribing we proscribe don't do this don't do this sort of thing so th there is a small set of individuals who have what is called as absorptive hypercalcemia it means they are absorbing more calcium so this set you will get an idea when you look at the urine calcium you know, no one does gut absorption of calcium in routine practice so if you find that the patient is having more urine, uh, calcium in the urine this patient may have absorptive hypercalcemia so be careful about the calcium you are giving the other patients really even if you continue with your small dose because if you don't give these patients enough calcium the parathormone will go up and it will pull calcium out of the bones so instead of renal stones you will end up having uh, osteoporosis and other bone problems all said and done there there was one group from new zealand which looked at this calcium supplements and they spoke about higher incidence of myocardial infarction now new zealand you know is a milk rich country and they really have no business to do calcium supplementation so then the europe us wherever there is more milk intake you really don't need supplement but like i said in india 350 mg is our average intake we need to take supplements but if there was something specific in terms of contraindication for calcium tablets no, I had in mind if no nah, not no not really uh, the common reason i i need to withdraw calcium is constipation yeah that is the common reason we need to withdraw and if a patient while on con calcium supplements develops a stones stone. yes. i don't know what to do no no that that you will have to stop you have to stop yeah and <coughs> okay uh what is the dose of calcium that you give to a post menopausal female supplemental calcium so i try to manage with a 500 mg calcium carbonate uh, to begin with and see that they take enough calcium in their diet very rarely has there been a situation in a normal post menopause that i need to give more than one tablet you know? Uh, the uh, rare situations of hypoparathyroidism and all that where we end up giving 2 to 3 grams of calcium those are not probably for uh, today's practice but yeah you would manage with 500 mg and see that you know if they tolerate milk if they don't tolerate milk and they are not taking enough green leafy vegetables and ragi and things like that then probably they may need two tablets a day also would you say that if a person is above the age of 50 male female menopausal or not hmm. they should take 500 mg would you say yes to that uh, i mean again if they can manage without it well and good however if they feel you know this is the best we can do with diet then all of us need it uh just a vote here all those here who are above 65 and not taking calcium daily please raise your hands okay so, so most of them are making mistakes no no they they have to answer the question what is the calcium in their diet simple as that so if your dietary calcium is good you don't mind that yeah okay uh, no so i mean uh, most of us would have tea and coffee with just a uh, dash of milk so that's really not count unless you're telling me you make uh, like my what boy used to make in the iccu where <laughs> it was milk and tea leaves okay uh, so <clears throat> i think physician treat that self becomes an important area here where we ourselves probably don't take the indicated supplementation that we should uh, uh, now i think this is what Uh, what i want to talk about calcium here so, so yeah we'll take questions okay yeah yeah he had asked should <coughs> all hypothyroid patients take calcium no so the answer is forget about the hypothyroidism stick to the calcium part there is no any other calcium related question yes sir He 
he is asking does active exercise help incorporate calcium into bones something like that yeah absolutely is right just sitting on the chair and taking calcium is not enough you have to have adequate amount of vitamin d you have to have weight bearing exercise so one exercise which is useless when we talk of calcium and bone is swimming exactly not walking walking is good walking swimming is a wonderful exercise when it comes to aerobic exercise but it doesn't help the bones sir dr pankaj he is asking how do we decide whether a person needs calcium does serum calcium help what does what helps no so the body will maintain calcium phosphorus in the normal range irrespective of your dietary intake of calcium so if you want some fancy investigations you can do urinary calcium or fecal calcium which i told you is not in routine practice ask two three questions to the patient if you feel that they are taking enough calcium in the diet well and good otherwise they need supplements dr subodh so there are no investigations that you can do citrate malleate you try citrate malleate according to him and hope that that works dr bamre ckd and calcium so there is a calcium which is specifically meant for nephrology patient that's called calcium acetate for this practice no because it's very expensive but for nephrologists it works wonders and uh, they could write it otherwise uh, citrate malleate is a good prescription for them also so calcium acetate lowers phosphorus that is the reason why they use that so there are what she is saying is many patients themselves say ki main teen mahina calcium leti hu teen mahina nahi leti hu fir teen mahina leti hu etc is that nonsense no really we need it every day if you are want to give a break once in a while please feel free but uh, we need it every day dr hina correct the question is rural india patients don't get as much osteoporosis or fractures that is an assumption i suppose having despite having poor milk agreed okay any so any when we are talking we are talking of 1000 mg requirement of calcium probably that is over kill because we are vitamin d deficient if we have enough sunlight exposure sunlight between 10 am and 3 pm not early morning late evening if you are working in the fields you are probably likely to be better off than a mumbai car they don't have pollution because pollution also cuts down the uv light reaching our skin so that also reduces vitamin so if they have less calcium but they have enough vitamin d then that 1000 mg which i said may change to even 500 mg so your rural worker is working out in the field they are more active they probably have more sunlight exposure less pollution and multiple other things so they are maybe healthier than what we are welcome to that dr bamre dr bamre is asking if after parathyroid thyroidectomy say for adenomas is calcium supplementation lifelong no so just the adenoma you don't have to worry it's like any other patient that we or person that we are talking of the nightmare for us is the surgeon has damaged or removed all the four parathyroids and then it is terrible because i said you need 2 to 3 grams of calcium they don't retain the calcium everything goes out in the urine they have problems of renal stones 
Today, fortunately, we have parathyroid injection which we can use. Then they behave very nicely. But if you have removed one adenoma, then there's no issues. Yeah, Dr. Sheila. Sure. Yeah, that will give you about 150-200 milligrams of calcium. No, no, the answer is that when you the remove… Question. Uh, question was, you're talking about the parathyroid one or her. Her question was that instead of milk, if you take paneer or curd or any milk product, rasmalai for example, yeah, you, you, you can definitely do that. I can add to that, uh, if you go through the charts, Cottage cheese, paneer, contains less calcium per gram than regular milk, much less. So maybe the grammage wise you might have to modify the amount of paneer that you take. Uh, Dr. Shukla? No, 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 no. The New Zealand study we are not interested. We have written it off saying that it doesn't apply to us. Cardiologists are saying, removing calcium from the prescription, you remove cardiologists from the, your referrals. No, no. So, cardiologists are worried about uh, uh, calcium deposition in the arteries. Mm. Yeah, but that, that is a part of aging and atherosclerosis and not excessive Despite calcium. Your... Remember one thing, calcium absorption is an active process. Just because you give two grams of calcium to your patient, doesn't mean that his calcium levels will go up. So, calcium absorption is controlled by activated D3. So, in, they, in, you know, in, uh, yeah, there is a milieu inside, more calcium, less vitamin D, less PTH, less absorption. No, no, did, did we use the word of sex? No, we said yeah, somewhere we said post but it applies to everyone. Yeah, all genders. Yeah, <coughs> so, okay, okay, so <coughs> calcium, magnesium, very good, but <coughs> most of us don't need magnesium supplement if our diet is normal and if we don't have GI problems and if we are not on diuretics and cardiac function is normal. So, most of us don't need magnesium. This pot vitamin K thing, you know, the first time I heard of vitamin K2, was in the early 90s in an IOF conference in Bangkok. I didn't know what was K2, but this was in the early 90s. And there was a lot of excitement about <coughs> adding K2 to our, to our supplement and reducing the deposition of calcium in the arteries. But slowly, slowly, within a year, why slowly? Within a year, the whole world decided that it doesn't work like that. So, except India, you don't get K2 in any calcium tablet anywhere in the world. So, we are unique, probably a marketing gimmick, there is no need for K2 in our patients. Unless, you know, you say there is vitamin K deficient in one or two patients, that, I mean, Dr. Tushar is a better person to ask. You had a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hydroxy He's asking appetite. about the brand triple A cal which has what I don't know. Hydroxy appetite, it's organic calcium, 100% absorption, it gives you 100 milligram per tablet. So, you can do your mathematics to see how much you'll need to give 500 milligram. It's very expensive. Devish? No, no. So, that's what we said. Everybody needs calcium. Everybody needs vitamin D. Whether you take it from diet or from supplement is something which you have to decide. Uh, she's asking, uh, what are the symptoms of deficiency so that even young people can be started on calcium supplements? What are the symptoms that we should look for? There, there are no symptoms. So, that is the problem. The second one you said, aches and pains, vague, vague aches and pains, backache, cramps. So, those things uh, would indicate that there is a calcium issue, but 
more often than not it's asymptomatic because the PTH hormone will see to it that your calcium is normal. So we'll uh, just, uh, sorry, we'll uh, go on to vitamin D and then come back to calcium, vitamin D both together, together. will be always just a very basic uh, sunlight falls in the skin, you form cholecalciferol that goes to the liver, you form 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, you go to the, it goes to the kidney, 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, it, that goes, that is the active D3, that goes to the gut, absorbs calcium from the gut and brings calcium to the bones. That is the, uh, that is the cycle of calcium. So now we come to vitamin D. And uh, the first question that he also wants to address uh, with emphasis, emphasis is why are all of us so deficient in vitamin D? So the thing is, uh, we have been taught that vitamin D is produced when the sunlight falls on our skin. So why should we have this problem? And it's pan-India. It has nothing to do with Mumbai or uh, North or East. It's pan-India. Enough data is present for that. And India deficiency. Yeah, we are all deficient. So the reasons, one is probably our skin color doesn't allow for enough UV light. So you need UVB radiation to fall on your skin to bring about vitamin D production. It has to come, maximum is between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. when the sun is right over the head and not early morning or late evening as a lot of people think. The second thing is pollution. Dr. Akashi, I don't know how many of you know him from Hinduja Hospital, he had got a UV meter from abroad and we had done a study uh, requesting policemen in different parts of the city where they are standing on duty for long hours. So pollution is very high, for example, Kurla area and you know things like that. So that's the other thing. We don't go out in sun when it is required to go. Generally when we go, we are all covered up. and. Even if sitting in the uh, room, your simple glass also cuts off the UVB light. So that's why it doesn't go in. So I think these are the common reasons. Uh, we don't go sunbathing and uh, sunscreen user usage also cuts off all the UVB light. So, you, so between dermatologists and endocrinologists, we keep fighting. Between skin cancer and osteomalacia. Yeah. So my simple one-line answer is, more than calcium, you need vitamin D supplements. Uh, what are the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency? So, so actually, vitamin D deficiency is the same thing. It's it's what we said, calcium deficiency. Because vitamin D works through PTH and calcium only then. So mostly asymptomatic. Yeah. Mostly asymptomatic. Uh, how do you test for vitamin D deficiency? So, Vitamin D deficiency, as we did in that Adhe Idhar, Adhe Udhar, is we are doing 25 hydroxy D in the lab. And uh, it used to be a very expensive test. Now, because of these packages, the test has come down. In practice, I very rarely ask for vitamin D. Enough research has been done, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, take it for granted that your patient has vitamin D deficiency. Unless you feel that some other doctor has already loaded the patient with vitamin D. Uh, generally what we do in practice, we don't have to worry. So once in a year or once in a while you want to do a 25 hydroxy D, please do it. I very rarely ask in practice. It's easier to do a calcium. So calcium would cost 150, 200 rupees. Any good lab will give you that. So I'm more worried about calcium going high than it going low. So, uh, this is the truth, maybe not the whole truth, you know, no? you, I'll speak nothing but the truth. <laughs> uh, so, the truth is that Jain people have low calcium, vitamin D. The whole truth is that all of us, irrespective of our religion, have low calcium and vitamin D. Okay. Uh, what are the types of vitamin D preparations commercially available and which are useful and which are not? Okay. I could speak for two hours on this, <laughs> because this is one of my favorite and, you know, irritant tropics. <laughs> so when we were young, so I am talking of the 80s, there used to be an injectable vitamin D, 6 lakh units, which used to give 
to all the children in the pediatric OPD, break the ampule and put it in a spoon and put it in the mouth. Very good. And today also if someone is doing, I have nothing against them. My issue is against my colleagues, uh, the numbers are coming down, who give the injectable 6 lakhs once a week for 6 to 10 weeks. So if you do your mathematics, we are talking of 36 lakhs to 60 lakhs. However, having said that, nature is very kind. You don't see vitamin D intoxication in these patients. What we have started doing, or now recommendation from all uh, societies, whether from India or from the US, 60,000 units. There are 100 plus brands. Go for a good brand. Powder, capsule, tablet, Liquid. shot, nano shot, whichever you like to give to your patients, once a week for 8 weeks. 60,000 into 8 is less than 5 lakhs. So where we were giving 6 lakhs unit once a week and now full dose is 5 lakh units. 8 weeks, you correct most of the deficiency and then to keep the patient stable or keep the person, forget patient, person stable once a month. Now there is some confusion once a month, 60,000 or 2,000 every day. Okay, so whichever way you are comfortable, there are some studies which say that no, 2,000 every day is better than 60,000 once a month. But I think the important thing is it should go and vitamin D in this dosage is very safe, doesn't cause any problem. Once in a while to be confident that you are on the right track, do a vitamin D. What is not to be done is to use the activated D3. It is not meant for all of us, except chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, uh, someone is in a great hurry, severe osteomalacia, so very restricted for a finite period. The problem is, in India, there are a lot of calciums which contain activated D3. They should actually be banned. Nowhere in the world. Just like I said, K2 is not used anywhere. Vitamin D also activated with calcium is out is not available anywhere else in the world. It is purely a pharma-driven initiative. I have got into trouble with them, but I don't care now. It should not be used. The only time, or most of the time, when you see vitamin D intoxication, it is because of use of activated D3. Okay. I, 6 lakhs unit, once a week, 6 weeks, 36 yes. lakhs, you rarely see, because nature has given you a defense mechanism. That 25 hydroxylation is a rate limiting step in this whole process. Oh, so the liver won't convert exactly. only. Exactly. Oh. So that nature has given you. The other thing is, I said give orally. Those who give intramuscular, very painful injection. But again, there, there is a lot of granuloma formation. The D3 injectable doesn't get absorbed as good as the oral one. So, you know, it is against our thinking. Injectables always get absorbed more than the oral, not with vitamin D. So that is, yeah, so those are all good. The water, the oil soluble, water soluble, tablet, capsule, granules, they are all very good. Is there any evidence that the nano liquid is better in absorption? Yeah, so there is a good amount of evidence to say that because it, it is, contains its own oil, you can take it anytime, you know, independent of what the meal was there earlier. And the rate of absorption is better. better. But does it make after a difference after two months? I, I don't think so. so that will bring us to what is the normal level of D3 that you should have in the blood? This is a controversial So, area. yeah, if you look at the reports, the normal D3 is more than 30 nanograms per ml, which is an individual's, uh, you know, normal report. But population studies have shown that if you take anything above 20, that is acceptable. So as an individual, I want my report to be above 30. But if we take the whole population as such, anything 22, 24 is also acceptable. Why this 30 came up? is It's an extension of uh, the action. Of, so what does vitamin D do? It keeps the calcium normal. If the calcium is not normal, the PTH starts going up. 
So based on research of the PTH levels, I mean, why 30 is enough? Why not 50? Why not 15? So that, that is the time when the PTH starts rising. So 30, 25, 35, 40. Now is 80 better than 30 or 60 better than 30? Answer is we don't know. He asked a question about vitamin D and falls. So possibly that is the only thing which is very clear beyond muscle because you know it affects your muscle coordination, affects muscle strength. So normal vitamin D levels reduce the falls. Beyond that, today the hottest topic is not muscle and bone and vitamin D, but vitamin D and immunology, vitamin D and cancer, vitamin D and diabetes, vitamin D and what not. Infections. Infection. Because nature has put a vitamin D receptor in every cell. So the argument is if nature has put a receptor in every cell, there must be some function of vitamin D. But today as we speak, we are very clear about muscle, we are very clear about bone. Beyond that, it is uh, still subject to confirmation. Oh, you said osteomalacia. Uh, can you just explain to us the basics of the pathology okay. so in osteomalacia and two things against osteoporosis? Yeah, we, we talk about two things, osteomalacia and osteoporosis. <clears throat> so the first thing is, osteomalacia is a disease of the growing bones. That means children. In the children, we call them rickets. In the adults, we call it osteomalacia. 95-98% is because of vitamin D deficiency. Some of it is phosphorus, some of it is vitamin D resistance. Let's not go there. Most of it is vitamin D deficiency. Osteoporosis is a disease of aging, where the bones become brittle. Osteomalacia, the bones become soft. That is why you have deformities in rickets but they break in osteoporosis. A simple way of understanding it is, you have a wall, brick wall. There are enough bricks, but there is not enough cement. So the wall is complete, but the cement is not there. So it is weak. That is osteomalacia. In osteoporosis, the cement is okay, but the number of bricks have come down. So that is why it can break easily. So this is, at the end of the day, if you ask me, everything is related to calcium and vitamin D. But the mechanism is different. So osteomalacia has to be treated with enough calcium, enough vitamin D, whereas osteoporosis is a different story altogether. So would osteomalacia have symptoms? Yes. So again, osteomalacia, like calcium deficiency, they are all related, you know, you can't dissect them, would very often be asymptomatic or have all the vague complaints, backache, muscle pain, cramps, tired at the end of the day, you know, you're not sure, but you're not feeling the best of health. Start treatment with calcium and vitamin D or vitamin D and calcium in that order and you'll see a big difference in the person. If you say that we should take 60,000 units every month, you are talking about which age group? Everybody? Because everybody has a sunlight problem. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> everybody. the answer is everybody. So if and if vitamin D acts via absorbing calcium from the gut and if everybody is taking vitamin D but is not taking calcium, are you doing half the work? Yeah, so I, I said we, we, we keep saying 1000 milligrams based on research on vitamin D deficient individuals. Okay. So if you were to correct the vitamin D, Maybe. 1000 may come down to 500 or 600. Because the absorption will be so much will better. Will be so much better. Correct. Uh, now, questions on vitamin D. He is asking whether we can use the equipment that gives UVB rays. It can be bought in at home also. And yeah, so that is a possibility. But uh, what books say is that if you sit in bright sunlight, 15 to 20 minutes, you get enough UVB light. But uh, again, with the sort of skin color we have, this may be not 20 minutes, but two hours. Not practicable to sit with the UVB light for two hours. You know? So the easier way is to just take the supplement. No, for pediatric. He's asking if pediatric dose is 60,000 per month. 
So pediatric dose is between 400 to 800 units. I think today per day. Per day. So if you want, if you have a deficient child and you want to correct that, then you have either 10k available, you've got 4k available. They look at it as a weekly dose. Unlike R60k, they, they, they are happy giving a 10k, correcting the deficiency. And then you can go between, say, 400 and 800 units. Okay, Rajiv. Yeah, He's asking if vitamin A interferes with absorption of vitamin D. So the multivitamin tablets, if you ever read, have very little content of everything. You know, so it's okay the B complex and all those things go away. But if you're talking about B12 specifically, then you need B12 tablets. If you're talking about D, then it should be specifically D or D calcium tablets. And A also, you know, normally you would need 5,000, 10,000 units. So I'm not aware of it interfering with the absorption of D, but we rarely have a combination which has enough D and enough A. Okay, you know. So, but it doesn't have D enough. It has 10. Yeah, Achha, so 10,000 D. Uh, yeah. So, so that is one good preparation because it also has 1,500 micrograms of B12. So, supradin. Supradin, is, uh, I think we'll have to Google this because supradin has three varieties: supradin, supradin plus something else. And the one which had high vitamin A, 10,000 units of vitamin A, has probably been discontinued. Yeah, because the D part in B12 is correct. You are saying right. Okay, Hina. So her question is that oral injectable, how often do we need to give it? So the injectable which we are giving orally is 600,000 units and 300,000, both are available. So you do your mathematics, once you have corrected the defect with one or two maximum, then you can give it once in six months, once a year. No, they wish. So that injectable is working better than oral preparations uh, is not a acceptable statement. It ha might have worked better in one patient or two patients that you saw. But we, I mean, if you look at literature, we have done a study at Nair Hospital also, where we com compared injectable, the powder, the tablets, and the thousand units a day. And um, very clear now that if you have deficiency, you need to give 60,000 weekly. Because if you try to correct the deficiency with 1,000 units daily, it takes a long time. The injectable oral actually produces a very rapid rise in D versus the injectable injectable. That has been shown by one of our students. Is good enough. Even two people are talking. Uh, you can talk. Dr. Sheila, last question. So most of she the... She is asking if you are giving 60,000, sorry, 60,000 every month, should you also give oral Shellcal HD or Tayo, no, which no. has vitamin D it's the every other day? Way no, no, other way around. She is saying that if you are giving calcium with vitamin D, should we give the supplement? Fair enough. So the answer is most calcium tablets have got vitamin D in the range of 400, 600. So that is not enough. So either you give the calcium, which has 1,000 units of vitamin D, then you really don't need to give it. Calcium, you must, uh, I mean, if lot or yeah, whatever it is, you must, if you see hypercalcemia, you have to investigate. Them. So, ionic calcium in, in our city, you should not rely on it. You should do total calcium. And if you want to correct it, you do the albumin, you get a better answer. If you have a good lab, uh, we recently had a, a set of uh, endocrinologists from U.S., who are talking about ionic calcium, free testosterone. Uh, 
with our setup, don't depend upon it too much. Mm -hmm. Olfactory method of calcium. No, the, the are you talking about calcitonin or calcium? No, the only thing I know is calcitonin. So, yeah, but osteoarthritis is. A, yes, osteoarthritis is a different chapter, I think. Uh, yeah, the, that they are giving, see, everyone ends up getting calcium even with osteoarthritis because there's nothing better we can do. Now you have this glucosamine, chondritin sulfate and this and that. But calcium and vitamin D you just can't do away with. It is a part of our growing bones. Dr. Kumar? Sorry? He's asking blood levels of 125 dihydroxy. Do you do them ever? And if you do when? So 125 hydroxy assay costs about two and a half to three times more than the regular 25 hydroxy D assay. It's a useless assay in most situations. Like I said, T4 and T3, I will rely more on T4 because T3 is maintained till the end. Similarly, if there is vitamin D deficiency, the 25 hydroxy D will low, but 125 will be normal. The body will make more of 125 hydroxy D. So in routine practice, we don't need to do it. Unless you've got what we call as vitamin D resistant rickets, or you are worried about vitamin D intoxication, or you have a granulomatous disorder like sarcoid, where you want to look at 125 hydroxy D with calcium, uh, hypercalcemia. In routine practice, you don't need it. Dr. Bamre? What is the Approach. Treatment or approach of vitamin D toxicity. Fantastic. Uh, so that's a thing which is used to be very rare. Now we see it and often. Uh, these patients may come with vague GI complaints, may come with vague neurological complaints, headaches, behavioral changes. I have seen before COVID one old mother, grandmother bought as dementia, uh, convulsion loss of consciousness. So a lot of metabolic, uh, I mean, uh, neurological or GI complaints. And very simple, just get a calcium done. It will be in the 13, 14, 15, 16 range. Get a vitamin D to confirm your diagnosis. That comes later on. And the management is very straightforward. All you need to do is hydrate this patient with saline. If the patient is not conscious or is not in a position to take it orally. Otherwise, just oral hydration will do the trick. It takes time, but it will do the trick. You don't need any great uh, panics, uh, attack and ICU admissions for all routine patients. Most of these patients come walking to your clinic, so you don't need to worry. It's only like that old grandmother I was talking who was bought as dementia. Fortunately, we picked up the diagnosis. Uh, someone had been giving her a lot of vitamin D, two days of hydration. Third day morning, she was like any other old lady, perfectly fine. Then that patient brought you another patient of dementia. <laughs> that you <laughs> just <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, about vitamin, active vitamin D supplementation when it is actually required. Say in yeah. CKD so patients, how much do you give 125 dihydroxy? So if you, first of all, I mean, this audience should not be giving it to CKD patients. It should be done by the nephrologist. Because there, there is a play not only with vitamin D, but with PTH. And we want to keep the PTH, so the normal PTH is say 15 to 65. For nephro patients, especially those who are on patients who are on dialysis, we are looking at 250 to 450. Because that PTH also is playing a role on the bones. You give extra 125 hydroxy D, uh, Josh may instead of one, you are giving two or three because the calcium was on the lower side. You will suppress the PTH and cause what is called as a dynamic bone disease, which is one of the big problems of chronic kidney patients. And that's why I said there should be a nephrologist looking at this. So if you have to use it, 
between one capsule 0.25 every day to alternate day is what is safe in your practice. So if, if you have a CKD patient GFR of say 50, then maybe you will give calcium 500 milligrams or whatever you want to give with Adrocaltrol or any brand of active D3 0.25 daily or alternate day. And uh, yeah, is there any role then of giving them 60,000 vitamin D every month? Yes, there is still a role <coughs> because 25 hydroxy D, although we say is an intermediate to 125 hydroxy D, probably still there is some amount of function of 25 hydroxy D, and a part of 25 hydroxy D also gets converted to 24 25 hydroxy D, not 125 but 24 25. So, there also there is something. So, if you keep giving only 125 hydroxy D, your 25 hydroxy D levels remain low, and which is not a good idea. So, this 60,000 or 2,000 every day should still continue even with CKD patients. So, CKD patients will receive both the active form and the inactive form of vitamin D. Uh, okay. Uh, that completes our vitamin D calcium discussion. Uh, Dr. Deepak, last question. No, In no. CKD patients, should we give regular calcium? No, no, we should give regular calcium. That uh, calcium acetate, I told you, is specifically for nephrology. And it it's good because it holds back the phosphorus. But if your patient's phosphorus is 4, 5, we don't need to give the, active, uh, the other calcium. Uh, uh, we can use our regular calcium. Okay, we have the last half an hour. All those who are awake, please raise your hands. Okay, okay, we we, we just last half an hour. So you should you should uh, stay with tolerate us. this well. Uh, yeah, we are coming to osteoporosis now. The last subject is osteoporosis, and uh, first of all, uh, we would like to talk about the concepts of physiological bone loss and peak bone mass. There are two concepts very dear to him and yeah. I think uh, someone was asking us sure. what age we should give calcium and then like. So there's a very interesting mm -hmm. concept called peak bone mass. Uh, let's say our, our average age here is about 50, 55 and uh, we are all working, we are all investing and we hope to keep getting interest till we age, uh, till we live. With bones, it is different. After birth, the child keeps putting on bone mass. During puberty, it suddenly jumps up. And then by the time they are about 30 or so, the bone becomes plateau. There is no further increase after 30. So that's peak bone mass. Then 30 to 45, 50, in males it is constant, in females, it may go a little up and down because of pregnancy and lactation. After about 45 in females, you know there is perimenopause and menopause. So that period, they end up losing even up to 3 to 5 percent of bone mass every year. So that is a major insult to the bones. In males, there is no menopause, so that goes on. By the time we are 60, we enter into the second phase of bone loss, which is called senile bone loss. The first phase was postmenopausal bone loss, which is because of estrogen deficiency. The second is because of defective 1 hydroxylation. The 125 hydroxy D goes down. So, if someone were to say, I am 65 and I should take 125 hydroxy D, he may be right. He doesn't, I mean, because I said 1 hydroxylation goes down with aging. So, after about 60 or so, everyone loses bone mass at the rate of 1% per year. So you can understand a 60-year-old male and a 60-year-old female, what is the difference? Number one, as children, pubertal stage, males are taller, heavier. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but they love more than the females, so they get more food, more milk. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that is changing now, but I'm talking of the old time. So by the time they are 30, there is a difference between male and female. Then menopause, pregnancy, lactation. So by the time they are 60, there is a huge difference between male and female. So that is why 30, 40 years ago, no one talked about male osteoporosis. Because no one lived up to that stage of getting osteoporosis. But today we are seeing 80-year-old males, 90-year-old males. 
their incidence of hip fracture is actually more than females. So, a 60-year-old female and a 60-year-old male, there is a female at a disadvantage. But by the time they come to 80, the males and females are about the same. So, that is something you need to keep in mind. So, if someone says prevent osteoporosis, you don't start at 60 or 50 or 40. You have to start right at birth, like the point that you raised, 2 years old or 5 years old or 10 years. Everyone needs calcium and vitamin D and exercise and play in the sun and stay away from the screen. These are all standard things. Bone toxins, alcohol and tobacco, terrible things for the bone. I mean, I'm not talking of good for health or bad for health, only from bone point of view. Steroids, other medications, medical illnesses, these can all affect the bone health. So you have to keep that in mind also. You know, sometimes what happens is you see a 60-year-old with a bad bone density report or a 50-year-old. The question you should ask the patient and yourself is, is this bad because he reached peak bone mass and came down? Or is it bad because they never, I mean, they were ill during school, never played in the sunlight, didn't eat well, alcohol, tobacco, uh, over treatment with thyroxin or heparin or uh, some other medical illness, steroids. So these are simple questions that you should ask before you jump into treatment. So if, if this is the concept of peak bone mass where 30, after the age of 30, there is no further increase, uh, what should be done in the younger people besides the lifestyle things that you spoke about? Any supplementation? Yeah. So what we've been talking, ensure that they have enough calcium in their diet and ensure that they, uh, you know, take enough vitamin D. So I think it does come down to be, be wary of what the diet is and increase the diet as much as possible in calcium and sunlight as much as possible for the physiological replacements at least. Okay, uh, osteoporosis. What lifestyle measures can help osteoporosis? Say exercise, sir was talking about exercise. What is the importance of exercise and what would you recommend? Yes. Weight bearing you said, so what would you? So the thing is, again, so osteoporosis is something which doesn't start suddenly at 50. Just repeating what we said that we need to have a healthy young age, healthy middle, middle age. Uh, weight bearing exercise, uh, whether it is playing a game or running or a brisk walk and weights. And today what is probably very good is to, if you've heard about the resistance bands, thera bands, because there you can't overdo, you know, someone picks up a dumbbell thinking that, oh, this is only 4 kilos or 5 kilos or 10 kilos, they may hurt themselves. But with bands, it's something which is only dependent on your energy levels. So your, uh, you know, tendons, how much you can pull it is what is going to work. So that's good. So daily or at least six days a week you need to do it and uh, swimming I said is a good aerobic exercise but not good for bones uh, anything else that you all like probably an outdoor game is is a good I think I encourage my patients uh, I'm not a good dancer but uh, those who can dance it's very good for them cycling is good no there is I mean it's no, no, so as long as you, you see, there is going to be a stimulus, your foot is pressing down something, so it goes up. up Isometric to component is there. Hmm. Okay, uh, when will you do a DEXA scan to diagnose osteoporosis without the patient giving history of fracture in an unfractured uh, person? Yeah. So, yeah, so fragility fracture if someone says, it is diagnostic of osteoporosis. You don't need any more investigation to decide to start treatment. But a DEXA scan, although it is not without its own side, I mean drawbacks, but it is the best thing we have today for diagnosing osteoporosis. It is recommended to do, let's say, five years after menopause uh, or 60 years in males or if there is you know, a little earlier if there are underlying risk factors. Today, diabetes has become a big risk factor for osteoporosis. 
Yeah, so that's another chapter altogether, but now we have started looking at it in the sense, whatever we used to talk about osteoporosis, for diabetes patients, we go back in the sense, the score, BMD score, anything less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis, but for diabetics, it's about 1.7 or so. Yeah, so this is the age group that you should do BMDs if it's available for you. The problem is that today, corporate hospitals give you health checkups, 50-year-old, 40-year-old, 30-year-old also, they do BMDs, the reports are abnormal. Remember, BMD is telling you bone density, the body, the bone composition. And osteomonastics also have low bone density. So the common reason for low BMD in a 30-year-old is not osteoporosis, it is osteomalacia. There the Z-score will help for my information. No. So, no. there the Z-score also will be low. Okay. Uh, so, preferably not to do not it unless do it there is a yeah. real compulsion. So, to give them a ballpark cutoff, everybody male, female, above the age of 60, one BMD necessary? Uh, I'm not sure how easily it is available. Remember that uh, sitting in this audience, everyone has access to getting a BMD done for their patients. But if you look at the country as a whole, if the last time we had about 170 machines for the whole country. Mm. So if you are in a tier 2 town or a tier 3 town, let's not talk about BMD, we'll talk of risk factors. There is scores available. This audience probably, um, again, I have a selfish interest because I'm very much interested in osteoporosis. So even if you were to do it once uh, in five years for your 60 plus patients, normal patient. If it's osteoporosis, it's a different story. Uh, it could be justified. But please don't make it a rule that every patient in India, every person in India above 60, because that will not be possible. Correct. Okay. So, uh, logistics is more of a problem than yeah. science. Yeah. Log okay. Um, you said some other investigations. Yeah. So, yeah. So, one is, I said, a risk score that uh, probably those who are interested, if you look at the FRAC score or there's an OSTA score, these are very simple to do and you can do it on your smartphone. Routine investigations, uh, you're looking at hemogram, a urine routine, because one of the common causes for early osteoporosis is underlying kidney disease, which you don't pick up. Uh, big mistake is to follow serum creatinine and say that the kidney function is normal. You look at EGFR, or look at urinary albumin mm -hmm. or albumin creatinine ratio. So hemogram, urine routine, calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase. Somehow alkaline phosphatase gets missed out, but it's a useful investigation. Uh, liver, SGOT, SGPT, serum creatinine, I said not very good, but in let, uh, later stages, it's definitely worth looking at. Beyond this, unless there's an underlying medical illness, you don't need uh, the thyroid or cortisol or uh, sex steroids. These have to be patient-based. One investigation probably which is useful with calcium is a PTH. I, I didn't say 25 hydroxy D because it is going to be low, but PTH may be a useful hormone, both in deciding the importance of the calcium levels and later on when you want to talk about therapy, then it becomes useful. Uh, for, the, for the students, BMD stands for Bone Mineral Density. The DEXA scan is a scan, it's a radiological scan, uh, which measures uh, the density. Uh, there are three components of the readings on a DEXA scan that you might want to know. Can you tell us those? Yeah. So when you see a DEXA report, I had messaged the Dex one, so two sample DEXA reports to you on WhatsApp group, so they know a little bit. Yeah, so DEXA report, you should first confirm the age, the sex of the patient. It will give you BMD values, absolute values. Then these have been standardized to a T-score. That means the patient's value is compared to a 25-year-old Caucasian female, white female not Indian female, not male. So even if it is a male patient, it is compared to that 25-year-old Caucasian female. And then you have a Z-score, Z-score, which is comparing your value to your peers. So 
so if you are 50 year old 50 year old same sex if you are 60 year old 60 year old same sex so the t value gives you an idea where you stand to peak bone mass the z value gives you an idea where you stand compared to your peers understand one thing that suppose you are 60 years old and you are comparing with someone with a peak bone mass you may be minus 1 minus 1.5 minus 2.5 minus 4 so if it is less than minus 2.5 it is osteoporosis minus 1 to minus 2.5 is called osteopenia osteopenia means less bone mass but it is not a disease by itself osteoporosis is a disease and uh, we do have this argument why do we need to compare males with female density but let's not get into it it is with a 25 year old caucasian female okay uh, so now which osteoporosis proven osteoporosis patient will you treat with pharmacotherapy everybody with less than minus 2.5 uh, everybody less than minus 2.5 or someone who's had a fragility fracture needs treatment for osteoporosis beyond lifestyle, calcium, vitamin D. We've all agreed that all of us need adequate amount of calcium and vitamin D, adequate amount of exercise. But over that, if there is a patient with a fragility fracture or someone whose BMD has gone mil below minus 2.5, or it is between minus and one between minus one and minus two point five, a lady between like osteopenia. osteopenia, but with a bad family history. So if there is a family history, especially in mother hip fracture, it is as bad as saying that I have had a fragility fracture. You know, it's mm. that equivalent. So these are the people we would definitely like to treat. Can you define fragility fracture for us? Fracture is a fracture which normal situation you would not expect. Someone is standing and they just fall down. You don't expect people to fracture because of that. You are walking, you slip, you put your hand out to save yourself, you fracture the wrist. You don't expect to fracture because so that so fracture where in a situation where you it is minimal trauma or no trauma. When you are going from perimenopause to menopause, you are still young technically your reflexes are good if you slip you will tend to protect yourself so you end up getting a wrist fracture coli's fracture as you grow older you get lumbar compression fractures because of the lumbar bones get the spine getting affected and then as you grow older 65 70 your reflexes become less you tend to fall down straight and that's why you get hip fractures so if you look at the epidemiology of fractures the first is the traumatic fractures in your childhood and 20s then you have colis fracture then you have lumbar spine compression and then you have hip fracture yeah uh, here since we just discussed bone uh, bmd one warning or one caution uh, bmd of which areas is important and which is not important okay that's a good question so most BMD machines give you three areas, lumbar spine, hip and the wrist. Don't look at the wrist BMD unless all the L1, L2, L3, L4 have been compressed or affected or operated upon and both the side of the hips are also operated on. So otherwise don't look at the forearm. The only time you look at forearm is I just told the patient has had multiple surgeries. Patient is so fat that they can't get onto that machine. Then you need to look at the wrist. And in hyper para, primary hyperparathyroidism, we look at the wrist. Otherwise, we look at the lumbar spine and we look at the hip. And if those who are really going to look at the report, remember that in the hip, there are three reports. Total hip, the femoral neck, and the ward triangle. That ward triangle report should not be looked at. Most people have now started giving total hip and the neck and they've removed the ward triangle. So you will sometimes get a report where it's minus 1.5 at the hip and the spine and minus 3.5 at the forearm. So uh, you uh, be uh, cautious that you cannot start on the forearm value to uh, with uh, replacement. Okay. 
uh, if you start with a minus 2.5 or less mm. uh, pharmacotherapy, what is your first choice? First of all, just give them the basics of the options of pharmacotherapy and then what is your first choice? So, the bone cycle is such that first the osteoclasts cause bone resorption. They try to, you know, repair the defects and then the osteoblasts come and make up the bone. So, there are two classes of drugs basically, one which will suppress the osteoclast and the other one which will increase the osteoblast. So, anti-resorptive and bone forming, these are the two classes. As of today, you have only one drug which is bone forming, that is teriparatide. And on the bone resorption, you've got three, four classes of drugs. You've got uh, estrogens, you've got reloxifen, which is the SERMs. We hardly ever use it, so don't bother. What is most often used is the bisphosphonates, which are reducing the action of osteoclast, they reduce bone resorption. And then you've got uh, the injectable uh, bisphosphonates and now you've got denosumab, which is a subcutaneous injection. So these are all anti-resorptives. Anti-resorptives, meaning uh, that don't allow worsening of osteoporosis. Yeah. And bone formation means it is actually mixed bone. And next year probably you're going to get a new drug in India. It's already there in the US and Japanese market, which is a bone forming agent, which is very exciting. But let's stick with our current, what is available to us. And you keep the teriparatide as a Ramban. You can use it for 24 months. You can use it total of 24 months. You can put it in one time or in two times. We have some colleagues who like to use it for three months and four months, and, but there is no recommendation for that. So for most of us, we should say 24 months or maybe 18 months. But three, four months, six months, it really doesn't make. It's safe. It used to be very expensive, but now with the Indian brands, from 20,000 a month, you've come down to three to 6,000 a month. Safe once daily at bedtime, subcutaneously. The anti-resorptives are a little confusing because you've got choice. See, when you don't have a choice, I said you have to give thyroxine or you want to give teriparatide, which we keep it for severe osteoporosis, more than one fragility fracture, you should give teriparatide first. But in routine garden variety osteoporosis, someone is postmenopausal osteoporosis, no one would like to take a daily injection for 24 months. So then we have oral bisphosphonate, either once a week, alendronate, or once a month, ibandronate. Injectable bisphosphonate, because it has been shown that in any chronic disorder, which is otherwise asymptomatic, people tend to stop taking it. More than 50% patients stop treatment at the, before the end of one year. Alendronate? Yeah with Alan Donate. <coughs> so it's better to give, but you tell your patient, these are the options. Injectable zolidronic acid is once in 12, once in 15 months. And denosumab is once in six months subcutaneous. Now, whenever we talk of a chronic disease, whether it is diabetes or thyroid or blood pressure or cholesterol, have you ever told your patient you have to take treatment for two years or treatment for four years? Never. But osteoporosis, we have to give a finite period because first there are all good things and then the bad things start coming up. See, the bone is turning over. So if you continuously suppress the osteoclast, the bone density will go up, but it will not turn over, it will not heal so hard, but it will bend and break. So that is why you start getting side effects after a finite period. So you have to tell five years of alendronate, six years of zolidronic acid, ten years of denosumab. So the period is increasing, but it is still a finite period. You can't say lifelong you take treatment, bye-bye, see you. You have to see them once a year or, or once in 18 months for follow-up. So it's an interesting subject, but something that those who are interested only should get into it. It is not like 
the hypothyroidism once you put it then it's on autopilot so for our fam family physicians or generalists if you see a minus 2.5 or low in a in anybody postmenopausal or elderly gentleman at our level would we be justified in starting an uh, intravenous once a year zolidonic acid in our opd give it in the opd or in the nearby nursing home once a year for 5 years will we be justified if you are interested in following up these patients and you are interested in this problem i think you are totally justified across the globe it is the primary care physicians who take the responsibility of osteoporosis see the person prescribing it may be a con specialist a consultant but at the end of the day it is in the, the family practitioners who for to whom the patient is going to go regularly so you must be aware of what is the thing like for example you say now this is uh, low bmd the other markers are all normal calcium phosphorus vitamin d everything is okay i want to give zolidonic acid please go ahead 5 mg intravenously over 30 minutes the only side effects that you need to worry is that like your vaccine you may get 2 days of fever we advise only paracetamol for 2 days uh, when we started practice uh, i used to see my ortho colleagues giving steroids to these patients this is a acute phase reactant it's a flu like reaction it settles down with simple paracetamol all said and done it's a safe drug uh, don't have to worry so and they give, oh sorry if they give it for 5 years how do they no, monitor so we, we don't give it 5 years continuously we say once a year for a total of 6 years but what we do is after about 2 years we check up the bmd and then after 3 years we check up the bmd so if the bmd has come above minus 2.5 hmm. then we can talk of what is called as a drug holiday see unlike periparatide or denosumab where there is no long term memory the advantage with bisphosphonates is it gets into the osteoclast and it stays there we say one year but in paget's disease when we give zolidronic acid the effect can stay for 3 to 5 years also hmm. so one year to emphasize that you have to come regular follow up but sometimes we are giving 15 to 18 months after the second dose check the bmd after the third dose again check the bmd you want to give a little gap then we follow it up with what is called as bone markers so that's another test which i don't want you all to get into it right now but if once you are seriously interested in managing osteoporosis and you have followed them up for 3 years so bone markers as the name indicates tells you what is happening in the bone you've given for 3 years bmd has now become from minus 3 to minus 2.2 you decide keep patient is now good stop the treatment Cal calcium vitamin d exercise will continue check the bone resorption marker this medicine reduce resorption as the name indicates resorption markers should be low but after 3 months after 6 months they started going up if they go above normal again start the bisphosphonate so that's how we can give a holiday but only with bisphosphonate not with denosumab not with teriparatide what does denosumab do different from bisphosphonates the osteoclast which are the bone resorption they eat the bone talk to the osteoblast saying that okay now we have done our work you start your work but the osteoblast control the formation and proliferation of the osteoclast so the osteoclast tell the osteoblast to start working but the osteoblast tell the osteoclast when you are going to start working so it's a control thing now there are something called as opg forget so there is a stimulus from the osteoblast to receptors on the osteoclast that okay now you start working you first mature and then you start working what denosumab does is it's a decoy that thing which is being produced the the carrier the messenger mm -hmm. from osteoblast it takes it onto its own side so it doesn't allow the osteoclast to get activated it takes away the these messengers which come from osteoblast onto its own side and doesn't allow it to go to the 
osteoclast. The action gets over in six months. So after about seven months or so, you will find that the osteoclast is there for ten years. Okay, we have data. Yeah. And uh, since the both, I uh, mean, can you combine denosuma with bisphosphonates? Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Both are osteo. In the long run, denosuma actually has a better efficacy. In the short run, for me, what is deciding factor is how compliant my patient is likely to be. Cost is one factor. The compliance is another factor. Probably if you look at age factor, then younger age denosumab, because in the long, you still, when I say younger age, uh, 55, 65 has got a... So, uh, one, one area of my grievance was that orthopedic surgeons especially give teripalatide fairly liberally without documenting... So that is why in an ideal world, it should be teriparatide followed by a bone resorption agent. So you would possibly, in a, in a, if more studies came up, would give teriparatide even at minus 2.5, not wait till minus 3.5. Yeah. So one of the, uh, you're absolutely right, because one of the limiting factors abroad, see in India, our patients have to pay for their own medication. So whether I, I write the cheapest or the most expensive, they have to pay from the pocket. Whereas abroad, it's the insurance which is paying. So you will see any guideline from UK, US, uh, other European countries. One, oral anti uh, oral antiresorptives. Two, injectable bisphosphonate. Three, teriparatide. Four, denosumab, because that is the way the cost of therapy goes. Mm. Here we are not bothered because our patients are paying. So we only see whether they can afford it. And then we follow our logic that what is the best form of treatment. So just a good Sorry? In, in abroad, uh, if the insurance has to pay. In our country, like he said, our ortho colleagues write it for every patient. So uh, just to kind of uh, give the basic information, teriparatide is a parathyroid hormone analog. And it's an injectable drug given subcutaneously on a daily basis. Denosumab is subcutaneous six monthly. Teripatitis is daily uh, subcutaneous injection. Duration of therapy, as he said, maximum is two years. And sequential therapy is defined as? One followed by the other. So you understand sequence, A, then B. Because Teriparatide, if you give for 24 months and don't follow it up with the anti-resorptive agent, then in the next few months, whatever the patient has gained is lost. So it has to be followed up with an anti-resorptive agent. Correct. Uh, a little bit about calcitonin nasal spray, because that is something that they have been familiar I, with. I can give you bits about calcitonin spray. One, it is a very expensive form of analgesia. And it is okay. Okay. principally indicated in vertebral uh, compression fracture fractures. Of pain. Yeah. So, and the dose that you use is not what is given. It is actually 600 micrograms a day. So that means three puffs a day. Beyond that, for osteoporosis, there were one or two studies. But today I can summarize everything that it is a useless drug for osteoporosis. And the best part is that it is banned in Europe now because of mm -hmm. risk of cancers. So one line is that forget about calcium. Calcium, yeah. And lastly, the most important thing for them is whenever you give any osteoporosis pharmacotherapy, they must make sure that calcium and vitamin D is supplemented before starting the therapy. Yeah, I think these are golden words that before you start therapy, ensure that there is enough vitamin D because bisphosphonates are very dangerous in a milieu of low vitamin D. They can worsen osteomalacia. And see that the patient gets enough calcium. I think we'll end here. We'll not take any questions and answers because we have to go home and sleep. Uh, sir has an afternoon nap, <laughs> which he's used to. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll just give uh, uh, a token of.